Kush was an amazing empire because two words, it adjusted and it adapted. And this is best seen through the fact that over the 2,700 years that it existed, it had three separate capitals. The capitals changed from time to time because Kush was making adjustments. And I think that's a lesson for us in the world today, particularly black people living in America and other places around the world. Sometimes you have to move. Sometimes you have to adjust to the circumstances. Even though you don't like what they are, you adjust, you adapt, you survive, you continue on. The first capital of Kush was Kermer. Kermer came into existence somewhere around 2700 uh, BC. It lasted for roughly 1200 years. There's some discussion and debate about how long it lasted, but we know that it came to an end when the Egyptians came down and damaged it, destroyed it because of the fact that they, that the Kushites had partnered with the, Hiss, the Hyksos, which is the Semitic people from Palestine who came in and dominated and ruled Egypt for a certain period of time. So Egypt wanted to make sure that Kush would not support its enemies in the future. So karma fell. But before it fell, it was known for uh, smelting iron. It was known for pottery, very distinct pottery that um, it, you can see in, in different museums around the world today, gorgeous pottery uh, that when you see it, you know it, it comes from Kush. It was known also, Kerma was centered in a location where it was uh, at a strategic location in terms of this, the trade routes between Egypt and uh, inner Africa uh, and trades that went from the Horn of Africa to the Red Sea. So that's one of the things that made Kerma very wealthy and very powerful early on. But after the Egyptian um, attack, roughly around 1500, uh, BC, then the people of Kush moved their capital southward to Napata or Napata, and it was there that uh, it relaunched itself and continued to exist. Now, what we should know from past uh, posts about Napata, that is the place where Alara, Kashta, and Pianke uh, formed and uh, executed its wonderful plan to rise up and rule over Egypt. Uh, this occurrence is referred to, or in, in, in Egyptian history, uh, the rule of the Nubians is referred to as the, the 25th dynasty. So not only did uh, the Kushites adapt and adjust for the circumstances, but they regrouped and they came back and, and they launched their plan from their second capital, which is Napata. But again, uh, there were further conflicts and wars and attacks from Egypt because there were times when Egypt was weak and when e Egypt was weak, Kush was strong and vice versa. And during one of those periods where uh, Egypt was coming out of what is referred to by Egyptologists as one of their intermediate periods, it came to Napata, the second capital of Kush, and burned it to the ground, destroyed it. Now, what Napata was also known for before that is where the royals were buried, where the kings were buried, and there's still some graves that they discovered in and around uh, Napata, uh, Kushite uh, kings, queens, and other uh, people of, of importance and significance were buried there. But what did the Kushites do? True to form, they adapted and they adjusted, and again, that's a message to us today. In the midst of chaotic and unfavorable political and economic circumstances, we can whine, we can complain, or we can adjust. When we talk about our ancestors and, and venerating them and honoring them, one way that we can venerate and honor our ancestors is by doing what they did, adapting and adjusting. Now, the last capital of Kush, Meroe. Meroe is known for the fact that the, the Kushites perfected the smelting of iron. With that, they uh, created uh, very complex and very effective uh, weapons of war. They uh, refined their farming tools. Uh, so again, at every stage, when they could have simply thrown their hands up in the air and said, we give, we give up, we tried multiple times, it didn't work out, they continued to reinvent themselves and they continued to get better and to perfect their craft and their technology. One of the things that they also did uh, was develop a written language referred to as the Maroritic script. 
often when you hear about Africa, when you think about Africa, how it's been portrayed historically on National Geographic and other historical sites, it's a bunch of black people running through the jungle in skirts and, and bones through their nose and, and exotic earrings. And I'm not trying to play, uh, speak to that because that's part of culture. And I think it means something and it has worth and value. But these people in Merrill way had their own written language. Egyptologists and other nubiologists have been able to decode it, but they don't fully understand it. So the culture and the civilization of Kush continue to evolve. That's the point. Uh, smelting iron uh, is often been referred to as the Birmingham of, of East Africa, because if you know something about Birmingham in the United States of America, you know that that is where uh, a lot of iron ore is extracted from the ground in the United States. But before that, thousands of years before they found iron ore in the United States, uh, the, the Africans were extracting it at Meroe. So at Meroe, you had Meroitic script developed, you had iron ore, and you had the building of pyramids. Do you know that there were more pyramids built in Kush than in Egypt? Kush has at least 200 pyramids. They're smaller, steeper slope, but nevertheless, they are there. So much to know, so much to learn about Kush. Hopefully, I'm whetting your appetite and I'm inviting you to do some independent study. We'll continue to talk about Kush. I'll see you next time.